This is Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic. And this is Father Gregory Pine. And this is Father Bonaventure Chapman. Welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. Welcome to the fourth, fourth Sunday of Lent. I had to remember which Sunday of Lent we were in. It's we're on, in, entertaining, enjoying, all of those things. It's the fourth Sunday of Lent. Welcome to this Lexio bonus episode. Uh, no need to introduce the Lexio bonus episodes because it's the fourth one in the third year that we're doing them. So uh, we're going <laughs> to kick things off by, um, you know, by the casual kind of banter that we usually try to do by talking about our, what, our favorite, our best, our worst mm. Lenten experiences in the novitiate or memories in the novitiate. So for those who are unfamiliar, the novitiate is the first year of our formation and it's particularly unique year because we're just learning to be Dominicans and we're learning to walk around in like ankle length dresses and like chew with our mouths closed. So it's tough. Uh, so not all of us make it. <laughs> That's true. Not everybody makes it even when those are the only standards. Uh, Father Gregory, what is your um, favorite Lenten novitiate experience memory? Yes. Nightmare. Um, so, so one initial thought this is actually during the Easter season, which means that I can't, I can't follow rules, but I was surprised by the fact that you go to church twice on certain days that mm. that surprised me. So for instance, um, like when I grew up, when we went to the Easter vigil, we didn't go to Easter morning mass. And then in the novitiate, we were just going to mass all the time. And I wasn't sure if it was like, you live at church. So what else are you going to do if that was the kind of idea? But then it became apparent to me that it's just like, if there's a thing going on, you're going to it because this is religious life. So I was, I was surprised by that. I was also surprised by, um, so we had that black cape that we wear called a kappa. And I was surprised by how many things I could get the kappa stuck in because I'd already gone through a season of my novitiate life where my rosary exploded at the least provocation because it was, you know, held together by the the weakest of wirelink chain that I have ever experienced in my entire life. Uh, but <laughs> so it was just constantly blowing up. But then I thought that I had made it through that difficult patch. And then Lent came and we were wearing a kappa more often. And I got it stuck in like every movable seat, which caused great embarrassment and uh, and near tearing. So Lent was a harrowing time for me. To be fair, your kappa is kind of like a tent because you're 20 <laughs> feet tall. Um, so it's impossible for you not to get it stuck in things because well, it's kind of like a, a kappa magna basically. It's just what you wear all the time. It's dragging behind you and having small people hold it up. <laughs> you don't need to defend him. I mean, his kappa is proportionate <laughs> to his size. I mean, we all had the same issue. Like he just didn't I'm just saying I'm not as tall as he is. So it, yeah, but it's, it was the same proportionally the same size no, well, Anyways, i mean the speed of light moving on changes <laughs> the distances yeah, okay. because of okay so at least i'll stick within the rubrics that i established with which are lent <laughs> uh, uh but i will give an appropriate father jacob bertrand response i realized in the novitiate how much i don't like lent because uh, mm -hmm. i think it was the first time that i actually like you know, you're forced in many ways to observe and to continue to observe Lent. And not that like, I mean, I tried to be faithful to Lent before, but like, you know, there's a lot more silence. You have to wear the capo a lot, which is great, but it does get caught in things. There's a lot more fasting or some more fast, you know, just those things. And it kind of, it's at the point in the novitiate too, when it like, you just want to be done with the novitiate. And it was, <laughs> I want mm. to be done with Lent too. So yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's it. Lent. That's, I mean. Okay. Um, yeah. So my one is, uh, I remember, I was hoping that no one would take this, and I'm glad that you didn't. Um, this is during <laughs> Lent. Uh, there was a, and this ties in with, actually, Father Gregory, so I'm going to, like, synthesize these two here in an Alf Um So <laughs> it was during Lent, and it was an extra service. We had this, like, St. Joseph kind of whole hagithos kind of, we had this weird evening event one night, and um, it involved carrying, um, like, a wooden board painted as St. Joseph to the front of the church. Uh, and then it was like St. Joseph of Arithmetheia or something. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. I was new to the Catholic faith, you know? And we had little flowers that we carried up and threw on it. And I think it was like Jesus's grave. It was supposed to be Jesus's grave, <laughs> but it was me throwing like a flower at a piece of wood. And I thought everything they've said about Catholics is true. 
Um, and we were seeing some Greek weird, like between Greek and Latin, Hagios, Otheos, whatever, blood, whatever, and then Sancte Forte or something. It was just an magical evening. Yeah. Do you remember, remember all that? I forgot. I forgot about it. Uh, I yeah, remember it's it now. It's it's rough when the people leading the liturgy or the paraliturgy <laughs> don't actually know what's like. Like, what is this? Yeah. Because it's very hard to then convince the laity of like what that is. So, yeah, we're throwing flowers on a board. Anyways, <laughs> it was fantastic. So, if you want these experiences, you too can join the novitiate of the province of Saint Joseph for Lent. Um, but <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna carry on to what you came here for. That is the uh, the readings and our thoughts, however deep or not they are, on the readings for this fourth Sunday of Lent. So we'll start with the collect for the Sunday. Let us pray. O God, who through your word reconcile the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, grant we pray that with prompt devotion and eager faith the Christian people may hasten toward the solemn celebrations to come. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Father Gregory, take us to the first reading. A reading from the book of Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have removed the reproach of Egypt from you. While the Israelites were encamped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated the Passover on the evening of the 14th of the month. On the day after the Passover, they ate of the produce of the land in the form of unleavened cakes and parched grain. On that same day after the Passover, on which they ate of the produce of the land, the manna ceased. No longer was there manna for the Israelites, who that year ate of the yield of the land of Cana. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When we, when we read these readings from the Old Testament and hear from the, the Pentateuch and then from the prophets, uh, when we hear sort of the, the recounting of the history of what God has done for his people, um, that ought to draw our minds short to what God has done, but also uh, draw our minds looking forward. I guess it's still what God has done, but forward to the New Testament to as, as a sort of in the Old Testament, a prefiguration of what's to come in the New Testament and in our in our own lives, um, in our relationship uh, with the Lord. And the line that sticks out to me is, is the first from this reading from the book of Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, today I have removed the reproach of Egypt from you. Often, I think when we when we consider what it what is it what I was going to say is entailed in maybe that's right in in the forgiveness of our sins in the mercy that we receive from God. Um, it, it's easy, perhaps, to forget that that God removes uh, the guilt of our of our sin through His mercy, through through absolution and the sacrament, through the waters of baptism. He changes us. It's not simply that He looks at us differently. It's not simply that He says, "Well, I'm no longer going to hold you accountable." Um, and we'll just kind of, you know, forget it and move on. But he, his grace changes, his grace forgives and his grace changes us interiorly so that we can, and we are conformed to God that we become, as St. Paul says, like gods. And we see this, uh, this promise, this sort of covenant, as we've talked about in the past, over the past couple weeks of Lent, this covenant being, um, proclaimed, being, uh, told to us so that we too in this time of Lent can prepare to be renewed again by the waters of our of our baptism by the renewal renewal of our baptismal promises for the catechumens coming into the church by the actual waters of the sacrament they receive to be changed to be made like God uh, which is an incredible incredible uh, gift and and promise our Lord our Lord has made the thing that struck me was the the relation between the manna and the unleavened cakes. So this is a pivotal transition point uh, for the Israelites because it's Joshua. So we're after the wandering in the in the desert for those years, forty years, and now we're we're in the promised land. And that's not just a change of geography, but it's a change of diet. Uh, in the in the desert, we've been eating manna that's been raining from above, and occasionally some quails, you know, step into your way and you get them too um, for the meats. But now. We're in the promised land, and so our food is provided not from above in some sort of miraculous manner, you could say, but from the land. This is where we're meant to be. We weren't meant to be fed from heaven in that supernatural way 
as a natural process for our digestion, our food, and our nourishment, but rather we're, we're given, we're supposed, to have, we're supposed to have a land that will produce for us, with us, uh, through our cooperation. Uh, it's a nice model one of, of the move from, from grace initially, it has to be from God alone uh, to draw us in and, and bring us out of our sins, but then a cooperation uh, with him in the sanctification, the process of sanctification. And more importantly, it's, it's an example of what we have today in a way with the Eucharist, because in the Eucharist, uh, we use the strange unleavened bread. You might have noticed that uh, you can't go to the grocery store and buy those little, those little hosts, um, or nor would you want to, I suppose, um, because they, they just taste different um, for all sorts of reasons. But they're unleavened bread, and it's important that, that they're, they're made in a particular way. And that unleavened bread is the marking back to this point of the promised land that the, the Israelites have finally made it. In a sense, the Eucharist is a, a banquet or a foretaste of the promised land we're supposed to have, the sacred banquet in heaven where we, we've, we dwell with Christ, here provided sacramentally in that unleavened bread. And we are not yet in the promised land of, of heaven and living with him. And yet the same point with the mass and with the sacraments, we are in the promised land for those times because he is there and he is the promised land. So the the pivotal point of the Israelites going from supernatural food to a natural f- food then reverses itself for us in a sense, having this natural unleavened food, uh, which turns out to be a supernatural food for again, returning to that supernatural nourishment that we find in the, the banquet in heaven. So I just want to, pick up with some of the heaven imagery because we've been accompanying the Israelites for 40 years as they, you know, make their way through the desert. And then now they're, they're on the threshold of the promised land. And so they're entering into the promise as it were, um, which is a kind of image of our own, you know, earthly pilgrimage and then our entry into eternal life as father Bonaventure described. And I think the, the, the differentiation between manna, which is food for the journey, and then unleavened cakes, which is the kind of abiding food of paradise, it, it marks for us the difference between signs and realities. So in the Christian tradition, in a big way coming from St. Augustine, but certainly picked up in the Middle Ages by Peter Lombard, you have this big distinction between signs and realities. There are things that point to, and there are things that are pointed to. And this shapes our understanding of the sacraments. So we typically describe this, the sacraments as efficacious signs or signs of sacred things that make men holy, but they, they point to, or they signify realities. And in pointing to and signifying realities, they make those realities present. And sacraments are, are proper to our time here on earth. They're, uh, they're signs for the way, they're signs for the journey. So what we await in heaven will not be sacramental. It will just be real. So you have no need for a sign when you abide with the reality. You have no need for a look further when you behold the very thing for which you have spent your whole life in pursuit. Um, So this is, yeah, this is why we'll say, you know, in heaven, you'll neither be married nor given in marriage because you'll have the Lord whole and entire. Um, This is why we say, you know, we won't, we won't celebrate the Eucharist in the way in which we celebrate the Eucharist on earth, because we will all partake of our Lord Jesus Christ in a way that is yet wholly more satisfying. And then this is the logic of St. Paul in 1 Corinthians, where he says, you know, faith will pass away and hope will pass away. Charity will abide. Why? Well, because faith is of things unseen and in heaven you'll behold and hope is of things not yet possessed and in heaven you'll have. Uh, Whereas with charity, right, that's something that accompanies us along the way and then abides forever in heaven because it's the real substance of our relationship with God. So I think that as we accompany Joshua into the promised land with those Israelites who have grown up in the desert, right? We set our hearts, we set our sights on the Easter season, the abiding reality of the Lord's, you know, resurrection and life, which we hope to enjoy forever and ever. Now the second reading. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. 
So we are ambassadors of, for Christ. And if God were appealing through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled with God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who did not know sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This passage obviously is focusing on reconciliation, and reconciliation is one of those words that has this ing-ed ambiguity, you could say. Uh, it could be an act or a product. And in the passage, it's both. It's both a reconciling, an action, uh, a present action, you could say, and then also a product, something that has happened, recon we're reconciled. And so Paul here is asking us to be recon. He tells us that we are reconciled uh, to God through Christ. That's that is an event that has happened because of the cross. And yet he still implores us to be rec to reconcile ourselves, to be in the process of reconciliation or reconciling. So it's it's a philosophical point about the ambiguity of some language uh, because our words don't necessarily convey or are able to capture the full reality of things. Uh, or, or we need to use we use less words than are possible for reality, but both these are true that we are reconciled to God through the sacraments and through His passion, and yet at the same time the process continues. Uh, this is a traditional notion of justification, sanctification this way, but we we are continuing to reconcile ourselves and one another with with God uh, to with God in Christ, so that. We're never quite finished, you could say, this side of heaven, uh, heaven's maybe our theme for these passages, um, with the process of reconciliation, with growing closer to Christ. That's the first thing. The second thing is that this reconciliation has a shape. So if I ask myself, how can I be reconciled to God? Um, you reconcile yourself with a person by uniting your will with um, asking forgiveness. So there's some sort of personal communication, you could say. And God, just qua God, seems sometimes as an abstract idea. We all know who God is. We have this sense of him. But it, he lacks a sort of definite, he, at least in our minds, it can lack a definite shape. Whereas we are reconciling with God through Christ means that we have a particular shape. I I, in a sense, know how to reconcile with a person, a human person, and therefore God in the second person of the Trinity incarnates as Christ, offers us a, a, a way to assist us in this reconciliation such that I can ask myself, well, how can I be reconciled to the person of Christ? What would it mean to be closer and more reconciled with him as a person in the way that I would be with, with other people? And then it means knowing him closer, knowing his desires, learning from the Gospels, talking to him, and this, and it gives me at least a shape, a particular kind of form, so that when someone asks me, how do you reconcile yourself with God, or how are you continuing to reconcile yourself with God, I can say I'm reconciling myself with God through Christ by being more like him, by thinking more like him, by, by loving him more, by conforming my actions and my movements and my desires and my thoughts to his actions, movements, desires, and thoughts. So I want to pick up the theme of reconciliation <clears throat> and just, you know, describe that in terms of salvation or divinization, the various things that we use to describe this one process whereby we are made like God and saved from our sins. And I was actually, so uh, I'm writing the fourth chapter of my dissertation right now. And I just was, I was just working on St. Thomas's commentary on this passage um, because one of the thoughts that's at the center of the thing that I'm doing is that God gives us himself, but he gives us himself in a way that we can actually receive, in a way that we can assimilate, in a way that we can kind of conform to. So I just, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the word righteousness here, which, yeah, it's, it's a word that's kind of embracing, but it's something like what we would mean by a kind of cosmic justice, which touches all those um, on whom it, you know, it shines down. Uh, so it's kind of like, a, it's like a things being as they ought to be in right relation, in right, in right union. Um, so in God, you know, we would describe this as a kind of divine justice. It, it abides in God as a divine attribute, but we aren't capable of, of receiving or assimilating or being conformed to divine attributes as divine attributes, because we're not God. We don't have the capacity to become like God in the strict sense. Like we'll, we'll always be human beings, even in heaven. So then how does that work? And one of the ways that St. Thomas explains it is that our Lord Jesus Christ is kind of like a prism through which the divine life is refracted. 
And when it's refracted, it's made kind of visible to us, it's made manifest to us, it's made communicable to us, and it's made such that we can receive it, such that we can assimilate it, such that we can be conformed to it. So there, you know, that like the, the divine justice is is made manifest, is communicated in our Lord our Lord Jesus Christ's justice, which, you know, is both divine attribute and human virtue, which is kind of, I don't know, it's like a nerdy sentiment to get excited about. But the thing that I love is that in Christ's flesh, we see the divine life accommodated to us for our reception, which just further hammers home this point of the divine condescension, that, that God goes to such great lengths in order to make it possible for us to receive him. Um, so we, we stress this often with the crucifixion that our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, suffered and died for love of us so that we might not perish, so that we might not, you know, live for eternity apart from that love. But we see it here in a very concrete way that it's like, it's like our Lord Jesus Christ is translating the divine life into a register or into an idiom, which we ourselves can hear, which we ourselves can speak back, which we ourselves can praise unto the glory of God. When we, all, when we talk about the things that, that Father Gregory and Father Bonaventure have been talking about, when we talk about the, the sort of point end of, of reconciliation, um, certainly it's to be, as they've said, to be in union and friendship with God and the way by which God makes himself available or and known to us as he reveals himself and makes himself accessible um, is is, you know, the means for our for our coming to know him coming to be with him. But it, I guess this is more of a, a sort of practical point for us um, and more of a summary, but it's it's important for us to recognize that God reveals himself wants to and works to reconcile us with himself so as to share in his life so as to make us his friends because this is the end you know this is for what we are made um and if we don't have that before our eyes always but especially now during lent as we're moving towards easter and towards the re resurrection towards the culmination in his passion of of all of this if we don't have the end firmly fixed before us then it's sort of a it, this, this, even St. Paul's talking about reconciliation kind of becomes a sort of, so what? It becomes a moot point in our lives. So we're, you know, as, as Christians, as, as our Lord's disciples, we're called to recognize that for which we're made, and in that call to respond to the grace to pursue that, to pursue that reconciliation, to pursue that mercy, to pursue that divine life that's on, that's on offer, to share in God's life and friendship now, but ultimately, and, and perhaps more importantly, forever, in heaven. Father Bonaventure, take us, would you read for us uh, the, the gospel for this Sunday? I will. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them Jesus addressed this parable. A man had two sons. And the younger son said to the, his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set out to a distant country, where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens, who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods in which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here am I, dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, Quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead, and he has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. 
Now the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf, because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fattened calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So in reading this Gospel from the 15th chapter of, Luke, uh, of Luke's Gospel, um, it's paralleled with two other texts or two other parables. It's like the most concentrated delivery of, of parabolic discourse in the Gospel of Luke. And then the, those other two parables are the parable of the lost coin and then the parable of the lost sheep. And I'm struck by the fact that in both of those parables, we end with a kind of celebration or a kind of feast. Um, so in the case of the lost coin, it said, you know, the woman finds the coin and then she calls together her friends and says, you know, let us celebrate on account of the fact that I have found my coin. Um, and then at the end of the parable of, you know, the good shepherd or the lost sheep, you have a similar sentiment of rejoicing on account of the fact that the one uh, had been recovered, whereas, you know, the 99 hadn't strayed, but still all of us partake of that joy. Now, what I'm about to say is not a strict reading of the text. It's somewhat inventive, so pardon it. Um, but I imagine that when the woman found her coin and she hosted a party, she used the coin to buy things for the party, right? She spent the coin in service of the community with whom she lived as a, as a way by which to rejoice. And I suspect, I mean, there's no way of proving this. And also this is fanciful. So here we go. Um, but when that lost sheep was recovered uh, and everyone was called together for a party, I, I bet you they ate, they ate lamb. Um, so there's a sense in which the things that are lost are meant to be found, not in order to be hoarded. Like, okay, I found my money, so now I'm going to guard it even closer and make like Edward Norton the Italian job and install a very high, you know, tech security system. Um, nor are sheep meant for being sheep, right? Sheep are meant for supplying whatever clothing and food for the men who tender them or for the men who, who herd them. And so I think that given that, given the, the proximity of those two other parables, it helps us to interpret what we have here uh, in testimony regarding this, this lost son or this prodigal son, um, because what he, what he loses and what he recovers is in a certain sense his sonship, which is signified by his inheritance. So he's, he's given his part of the inheritance, he goes and spends it, he goes and squanders it. And then when he comes back to his father to apologize, his father runs out to him and reinstates him in the kind of royal regalia proper to a son. So he's been made a son. And here we can think about our own state as Christians who are made adopted sons and daughters in the son. Uh, so then what, what does he do with that, cel like that sonship? He celebrates it. And I think this is part of the reason for which uh, the older brother who did not stray, the one who remained home, is so bewildered by the experience because he's like, I've been here, you know, like I didn't squander the inheritance. But I think one way in which we can read this parable is the father saying, your sonship is meant to be spent, right? Your sonship is meant to be used, is to be lived in, is to be, um, what would you say? Like it's, it's to be operationalized. That is not the way that I want to express it. But your sonship is for acting, for living, for abiding as a son. It's not for kind of guarding jealously for fear that it might perish. It's like the, the point of the Christian life isn't to merely avoid sin. The point of the Christian life is, is to magnify the God who is at work in your members, to be sons and daughters in the Son, and to be instruments of the instrument of the Godhead, which is to say like kind of extensions of our Lord's sacred humanity. So for us, this helps us to recognize the fact that the grace that we are given by the shedding of our Lord's blood isn't meant to be hoarded, it's meant to be spent. And in being spent, it redounds to his glory and redounds to our own sanctification. One of, in, in, I guess, following what Father Gregory said, the, there's the recognition of, of sonship, the return of that sort of sonship in, in the reconciliation experience between, well, with, of the son with the father. Um, one of the things that, that 
I often think about in reading this parable and hearing this parable is the sort of the, the what I I don't know what I just term is like the embarrassment of forgiveness. Um, certainly, I think when the the son realized when he came to his senses and realized that he had squandered his inheritance, used it wrongly, there's a sense of shame, um, a sense of regret, uh, th- those sort of things. We pick that up, but also I think in our in, in being forgiven, there's there's an embarrassment too. I imagine that the and being you know given the ring and the sandals on his feet and having the party thrown. I imagine the 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 son is would be kind of embarrassed, you know, for having been so prodigal but then returned uh, having returned to such a, a, a warm and overabundant welcome um there so i think we can experience the same in in light of our sin in light of our sort of squandering our inheritance um and returning uh especially back to the sacrament of penance um that is so simple and so easy and so abundant in god's mercy that you know we can think we're we're undeserving that well why would god forgive me i'm such a bad person fine it is easy it is simple it is overabundant and yeah why should god forgive you but but for the fact that he's god and that he he desires to share his life with you and if we look at the the evidence given to us in the gospel we know that god will stop at nothing to share his life with us this is what the crucifixion is about and what it ought to remind us that that we ought not be embarrassed by the abundant riches that God wants to shower and does shower us with in his mercy and in his uh, allowing us to time and again return to be the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter and come back to him. Um, so we shouldn't be we shouldn't be uh, surprised by our by God's reaction to us or or our own, but perhaps revel in the goodness and love that God has for us. It's a simple point and people have, I'm sure made it, I know they've made it many times, but the parable that we call the parable of the prodigal son might better be described as the parable of the two brothers, because it really is a story, as you can hear of, of two brothers and not just one. We focus on the one. And I think that's due to some evangelical hermeneutics that everyone's a sinner and therefore comes back and some hymns are involved in this as well. But the parable itself seems, seems to have the, three people the father and then these two sons which have which have two different responses i've myself always associated with myself with the older brother particularly um i've never got a sense of the the younger brothers kind of squandering things i'm you know more or less a good person following rules i guess and the older brother that has the challenge for that or at least the 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 gospel passages for a challenge for those who consider ourselves older brothers in that Although the older brother thinks that he's different from the younger brother, in fact, different in the very important way of he's good and the younger brother is bad and he deserves and the younger brother doesn't, actually they're very much the same. They're brothers of the same father and they're brothers themselves because they both, it seems, think that sonship, as Father Gregor was talking about, resides in material things and about the goods that would come from being the sons of this father. The only difference is one of them is more patient than the other. The one, the younger brother, demands his goods and his sonship now. The older brother, though, seems to demand he's waiting. His virtue, apparently, is that he's going to wait for his father to die uh, or for his father to celebrate a party, which he hasn't done yet. But don't worry, in the end, he's going to get it um, because that's what he really cares about. The father comes out to him and says, in a you know i mean deep embarrassment embarrassment i suspect we're not left to know what the older brother does at this but i suspect he'd be ashamed like father jacob Bertrand said as well in that the father says are you just my son because i'm going to give you things because of parties because of material things or are you my son because you love me i think here to tie again with father jacob Bertrand's notion of, of the sacrament of penance this comes in with the imperfect and perfect contrition do we ask for god's forgiveness because we fear the the pains of hell and the loss of heaven the the goods or and this is what the act of contrition tries to aim us for perfect contrition do we do we do we confess these things and feel sorry for them because god deserves our love because he is our father our loving father and we are his sons and daughters the parable of the two brothers especially the older brother is a, a check not just a gut check, but really a soul check on on me and my relationship with the Lord, asking, do I care about the Lord for the goods that he would give me? 
or because actually caring about him and being related with him is the true good. Well, with that, we hope our thoughts, comments on this Sunday's readings uh, are helpful for you in preparing for Mass and preparing to uh, receive our Lord uh, yet again in the Eucharist and especially in the mysteries of the Triduum that await us in just a few weeks. So we'll wrap up this week's episode with uh, the prayer over the people for the fourth Sunday of Lent. Look upon those who call to you, O Lord, and sustain the weak. Give life by your unfailing light to those who walk in the shadow of death and bring those rescued by your mercy from every evil to reach the highest good. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks again to all of our supporters. If you'd like to help out with our work, check us out at patreon.com slash godsplaining. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, like and subscribe, leave reviews. That all helps us a lot. Visit godsplaining.com to check out our merchandise, to find out information, dates, locations, registration for our three summer retreats that we have coming up at the end of July and August. And as always, thanks to all of you who have tuned in. Feel free to share this episode with whomever you think might benefit. And until next time, know of our prayers and God bless.